Welcome back. This is lecture three in Psych 221, Psychology Applied to Work at North Dakota State University. This lecture is called The Human Animal at Work. Okay, uh, this is the third lecture. On the first lecture, we went through the syllabus and we went uh, into what is IO psychology in careers and challenges and that sort of thing. In lecture two was the history of IO psychology. Uh, we also talked about how history is a story that we tell, uh, sort of a story we tell backwards that uh, um, grounds us in where we're at so we can make a decision about the future and that in inevitably um, telling that story, telling that history involves ignoring um, <laughs> um, uh, an infinite number of things and, and choosing with your value framework what are the events and, and drawing causal arrows uh, and that uh, we're always rewriting our history but at the same time it's, it's very valuable and essential that we have a history. So we told a linear narrative, a, a simplified linear narrative of the history of biopsychology where we had to um, select just a, a certain key figures and events. Uh, but that said, we, we, we started at the, the early 20th century and things like Taylorism, scientific management. Um, and then we talked about World War I and uh, selection processes and you know, testing. And then the Hawthorne studies in between World War I and, and World War II and the famous Hawthorne effect where uh, if a subject knows they're being observed, they tend to change their behavior. In World War II, a big thing for IO psychology was the emergence of uh, engineering psychology. Uh, and then post, post-war years, economic boom, uh, cultural uh, upheaval, um, civil rights area, um, uh, new labor laws, and then uh, postmodernism. And then the dawn of the digital, the computer revolution, and, and the, the massive amount of change that that uh, technology brought, which then became the information revolution and the, uh, and the internet. Um, and then uh, up to where we are right now with, uh, with the pandemic, with uh, globalization, and deglobalization, uh, and then the social media and all the things vying for our shorter and shorter attention spans. And all the while, IO psychology has had to evolve. Um, and, and at the same time, IO psychology has been challenged by the, the, this, the moving target from all of that change. Well, today we are going to talk about the human animal. Uh, we are going to make a radical departure from the book. And we are going to introduce some advanced topics. But we're going to do it, hopefully, in little bite-sized chunks, little elevator speeches really trying to whet your appetite um, for further exploration when you're, when you're ready. Uh, some of you uh, may be psych majors, um, in which case uh, you, you might want to dig into some of this stuff uh, when you have time right away. Um, some of the rest of you or some of you might not be all that interested in some of these more advanced topics now, uh, but at some point later in, in, in your life, uh, I, think you, I think you will be. And, and so I want to uh, at least expose you to some of these um, emerging uh, neuroscience topics. And um, to me, there is a, a, a consensus coming in the future in the field of psychology and neuroscience where uh, we, we might be able to get back to a dominant framework uh, that, uh, that is updated, that's, that's uh, tied to biology. Um, it, it, there isn't consensus that we have it yet, uh, but there's a lot of pieces coming together. And they're exciting, and I want to introduce them to you. Okay, so we are going to talk about how we are prediction machines, and how those uh, prediction machines are embodied. How, how how you know thinking and acting are really part of the same process, and how we're bounded, which is to say that our our thinking is constrained. Um, and we're going to talk about approaching and avoiding as some sort of fundamental modes. Uh, and, and we tend to approach goals and we tend to avoid uncertainty and then how we seek ni niches um, and how we can be horrible to outgroups. And then the reminder that the workplace actually is an environment. And so this is psychology applied to work. So as, as we think about these more advanced topics, um, we want to bring them back to what does this matter in the workplace. 
And then uh, we'll talk about evolution a little bit to remind you that it isn't just biological species that evolve. Technology evolves, culture evolves, and uh, it isn't everything doesn't evolve, but really, but it's it feels like uh, um, everything evolves. Certainly, uh, almost everything that is part of our culture and in part of our constructed environment uh, undergoes change. Okay, uh, as a reminder here, just in case uh, you had forgotten, humans are animals. And we do have a taxonomy, you know, we're, we're in the kingdom, uh, uh, animal kingdom, we're uh, vertebrates, we're mammals, we're primates, we're hominids, um, we're you know, the gen genus Homo and the species Homo sapiens. And that means technically uh, um, among, the, among the primates, you know, you've got things like monkeys and, and, and lemurs and apes. Well, we're apes, uh, but among the apes, we're the hominids. So technically humans are apes. Um, and if you want to keep going back to, on the lineage, that means, you know, technically at some level, humans are also fish, sort of. But just a, a reminder here that many of our, many of the processes and many of the things that psychology studies are predominantly cultural, um, culturally driven. Uh, there's there's many things that psychology has studied that then have come out uh, and, and 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 the um, media has said hey you know the, the this is how people are well it turns out no that's actually how um, um, undergraduate uh, Western uh, um, uh, students are uh, and and if you redid that study in a, in another country uh, or another time. Uh, you might have radically different effects. So a, a number of things that psychology studies ends up being uh, cultural. And uh, uh, the, it, there's been uh, criticism, uh, uh, rightfully so, to evolutionary psychology when it was a little more strident in the past. That, to, in, and that was back when people thought we'd find the gene for that on, on everything. And so we'll, we'll talk about this in this lecture uh, uh, as we go. But um, we, we are animals for sure, uh, but we are cultural animals. And it's very difficult to disentangle that. But in culture, uh, it, it is actually a, a massive influence in all of this. But, it, but you can't have a, a behavior that's 100% driven by culture because it's running on a biological substrate. You know, and, it, and if the behavior is at all complex, like involving language and, and interactions with, with, with people inside uh, cultural constructions, um, you can't have just a biological, um, um, psychological event, really. Um, so culture and biology are um, deeply entangled. Okay, so the first um, topic here that, that I want to present in little bite-sized chunks is that life really is about the future that uh, all of uh, life um, it has evolved in order to make a decision make a movement um, take an action decide not to take an action based on projections into the future if you um, are uh, if you reach and uh, grab something on the stove uh, and you weren't, you didn't realize it was hot, and you suddenly pull your hand away. You you didn't do that technically in order uh, to to deal with the present. Um, you you did that because you are currently damaging your skin and you're burning yourself. But you can't undo that damage. Uh, you can't go into the past. Um, and present is merely a moving line. Uh, but the reason why you have a, had a process to detect that pain in a in sort of a reaction, an almost instinctive uh, reaction to pull it pull back your hand, was to stop the damage so that you wouldn't have more damage. And that's all future oriented. And, re and really, kind of think about everything that you do or or your cat does um, when it's it's when it when it looks like it's responding to things. Uh, when if when you think about it. It's really about the future. Now, uh, an, a, a, a worm might be operating in the milliseconds to seconds range of the future, and humans certainly do that when you grab hot objects on the, uh, for, on the stove, but we also have an amazing brain 
and we can extend um, our thinking out far into the future as well. But really everything that life does, um, life is essentially living uh, um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a stream of the future coming at it. So it's a big conceptual leap and it is counterintuitive to a lot of things when we think about reacting. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that the concept of reaction isn't also useful, but uh, thinking about life as a process that's always future-oriented is a very valuable conceptualization. So yeah, life can't act on the past and the present's gone. I mean, the, the present is, we have this conscious feeling of present, um, but I mean, when is it? Uh, is, is it? Is it three seconds, really? A lot of things can happen in three seconds. Um, is it milliseconds? A lot of things can happen in, in, in milliseconds. Really, the, the present is a concept. And the present is a subjective experience that happens in our consciousness. You know, but from a physics standpoint, um, the, 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 unless you want to get into... Um, limit, uh, fundamental limitations like Planck, Planck's constants, you know, 10 to the minus 41 or something. Um, there really is no present. And so life is always doing something uh, either for the immediate future or the not so immediate future. And so here's a way to look at that. And this is a big deal. Um, you can think of the, 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 your, your DNA, you can think of uh, your genome as acting um, towards the future uh, but thinking, it doesn't think, but it's a, it is a, f a structure geared that's evolved towards the future. In this case, it's far future. It's, it's multiple generations. So what does that mean? Well, inside DNA are, are uh, chunks of sequences that, um, among other things, encode for proteins. And, and so there's, only, there's, there's all sorts of possible combinations that you can, you can take those um, base pairs and, and make um, structures with it. But there's really only a few that uh, make amino acids, that make proteins that are actually really stable. I mean, all, there's lots of stuff that's crap and there's a few stable things. And so life's evolved to figure out what these stable uh, protein structures are, for instance, within the in, in encoding part of DNA. Uh, and by encoding for it, it is essentially a prediction that these proteins will be needed uh, by future generations. So it's a way of looking at it, but even DNA is, is really future-oriented, but DNA is, is oriented towards far, far into the future. But uh, within the cells, you know, in multicellular uh, creatures like us or single-celled, that um, DNA uh, that is used to express chemicals. It's, it's used to express things that make proteins, or it's used to express things that they may be proteins, they might not be, t uh, it depends on, how you, depends on what you how you think about it, but DNA is, is either like a piece of information, like actual co uh, code gets popped out and sent uh, to make different cellular actions, um, or it's actually um, a thing that's actually a building block, it, you know, sp spit out um, a, a sequence that folds in, that gets expressed and gets folded in such a way, and that becomes uh, skin cells or, or, or some extra cellular matrix thing that, that makes a biofilm of bacteria, whatever. It, the expression of the genes is also something you can look at as a prediction. And it's a way of saying, okay, uh, the, the organism is, is experiencing some, some stress, and so there's a, a, a reaction that happens that puts out more protein that uh, tries to strengthen uh, a, a, a boundary of the organism or whatever. That is still a prediction. That's like pulling your hand off of a, a hot stove. So gene expression, uh, which really gene expression is, uh, is, is more important than genetics because you have to have the cellular machinery, you have to have the environment for that gen genetics to actually mean something. But it's a, acting in the prediction typically over the lifespan of the organism. And, and so you can think of that as shorter than what the DNA, the DNA actually in the genome is, is predicting over um, many, many generations. The gene expression is predicting within the lifespan of the organism. And then within organisms, we have these things like called homeostatic systems. Some people will, you might hear the term allostasis, and there's different ways of looking at it. But you've got mechanisms. We have mechanisms uh, like thirst, um, um, hydration regulation. Uh, and um, it's an evolved complex system, and, there, and it's full of cells, and those cells are, expre are expressing uh, um, genes. Uh, and that system, is a predictive system that's like, hey, you know, my my um, level of of uh, um, 
ion uh, uh, ions in in my inside my cells and outside my cells is getting out of regulation and it's because I don't have enough water and I've got to get this organism to get me more water and so while the so while DNA is acting on many generations and gene expression is acting on the lifespan of the individual things like the homeostatic systems are operating on more of like minutes to days like hey I'm it's too late if your uh, thirst management system, you know, only kicks in when you're just about to die of thirst, you know. So, so you, you tend to get thirsty, you tend to get hungry long before, you know, you're in jeopardy. <laughs> and that's on purpose. Uh, but it's a prediction. And so it's a prediction at a, at a shorter and shorter time scale. And that's what we're doing here. We're, we're getting shorter and shorter time scale, and, and, and this is a way of looking at life. Um, and then you have brains, and brains are doing more complex predictions. Brains are sort of simming the world. Um, they're experiencing a reality, and then they're sort of operating within it. Um, and that's often like a seconds to minutes uh, uh, um, time scale for a typical uh, animal. But it's operating in a predictive space. If you see a, a, a cheetah um, chasing a gazelle, and you, and, and you watch them, you know, if the gazelle's turning this way, the cheetah doesn't take the long way, right? The cheetah actually cuts the corner. Well, why? Well, that, it's because it has a predict predictive mechanism and it's not actually going for where the gazelle is now. It's gonna go for where the gazelle's gonna be. So all, all of life predicts. And, and as we get more and more complex, it's for um, predicting over a, a shorter and shorter time span, uh, but it's actually predicting at a shorter time span with more complexity. Whereas DNA is predicting over generations, but it's it's not dealing with the kind of complexity that a that a cheetah chasing a gazelle has to deal with. Okay, and then you get to consciousness, and you can think of consciousness as the 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 the, the highest, if you like, uh, predictive mechanism that's able to uh, um, control to some extent uh, the the full embodied brain uh, to to help serve the. Uh, um, the regulatory systems so that it can get this animal to water. Uh, and consciousness really uh, is operating on, on a very short time span, time span of just a few seconds. And it feels like now, uh, for a, from a subjective experience, it feels like this, this present, but you know, we have this, uh, uh, the, what we feel now is actually in, involves some memories of just a little bit ago. Uh, anyway, Consciousness appears to be focused on um, uncertainty uh, 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 and novelty and um, things that uh, happened that the that the rest of the brain uh, was, couldn't quite predict or predicted wrong. So um, w w consciousness, you can kind of like uh, all of a sudden have to attend to something because something happened that you weren't expected, and your consciousness gets pulled there. So consciousness appear appears to uh, be an evolved system that that can move the organism uh, due, due to um, um, circumstances that are just too unpredictable for the unconscious re rest of the system to deal with. So anyway, as you go uh, um, down these bullets, you're getting into shorter and shorter time, time scale. However, something really cool happens here, uh, at least with humans. Uh, and something uh, in the mix of the human human brain getting bigger, uh, um, and our ability to think and act uh, in that in the in that prediction uh, um, suddenly uh, um, inverted. So instead of consciousness being a, a thing that the that the cheetah is using to decide uh, where to, to where to turn to cut off the antelope, we can use our consciousness to actually move in space abstractly, to actually th actually envision a, 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 a far out future in the same way, um, to in this, sort of in the way that a cheetah is looking to cut off the gazelle in the, in the now, we can actually abstract out uh, through uh, our um, cultural constructions uh, that, that we use when we're, when, when we're thinking uh, to plan out advan uh, advanced futures. And so we actually then took our consciousness and by abstracting, by, by uh, sort of imagining, um, we can explode our predictive horizon without limit. Doesn't mean we're accurate. No prediction's accurate. Sometimes the gazelle isn't where you thought it uh, was going to be. But that's really you know, a big part of the secret to the success of humans. So this is a... Um, this is 
probably a lot uh, for you, uh, uh, but I really wanted to hammer this part of it home. That life is a predictive mechan mechanism, and a lot of this builds on where, where I'm, uh, this notion that consciousness and being able to imagine a future uh, uh, um, and, and how that how that how humans have sort of um, in, in, in inverted that that time focus to where our consciousness now can imagine any time scale and, and plan out our lives, how that uh, works with um, um, uh, the rest of our um, the rest of our slides here. So. Okay, so all thinking uh, and all feeling is really oriented towards the future. For most animals, it's the immediate, sort of immediate future. Um, but for humans, it's, uh, it, it is uh, as much into the, uh, uh, the, the future as we want it to be. Okay, so when we ruminate on the past, uh, we're doing it to hopefully find a better future. So this process of being able to... Um, this process of being able to imagine a future in our in our super powerful brains that can do that, um, we do the same thing when we go backwards. Uh, when we're and we're writing it down, it's history, and we just talked about uh, about about that in the last lecture. But when we just think about our own past and we think about decisions that we've made, um, this the same part of your brain. Uh, in a way that's that projects forward and it tries to decide which path to take. Um, we sort of relive past decisions um, to inf to in inform um, what might work now because we try to find things in the past that that look like they might um, metaphorically um, um, uh, or pattern match uh, a thing in the future, uh, and we try to abstract out and generalize things in the past. So we 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 live in the past to some extent too. This ability of of, of human brains. Uh, to, ha to allow human consciousness to um, imagine future states um, works just as well backwards. And um, uh, you know, one could argue that the, the backwards process is even more important because it lets us relive decisions. Um, and, and then we, it lets us sort of play them out. Uh, and, and then that is like a, a, a sim uh, environment, it's like a, tra like a training space. Um, so that when we encounter things in the future, we've really learned from the past in a way that's, 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 that's far more sophisticated than, than the way a cheetah might learn from the past. And obviously a cheetah does learn from the past. But um, anyway, hopefully you get, you get an idea here. Hopefully this wasn't uh, um, too over, overwhelming for you. Okay, so building on that notion, um, when we think, uh, it's really uh, navigating. When we, uh, when we uh, abstract out, um, we're really doing something akin metaphorically to moving in the distance. So when we think about the future, uh, w we actually sort of make um, time a proxy for distance. So think about a, a, a baby in the womb and it's pushing out its hands and, and uh, it's exploring its space. It's mapping its, its world. Um, and it's, it's got brain structures that are being mapped to its embodiment. And then when it can see, uh, and, and so when, when we look at mountains in the distance, that's not a passive process. That is akin to reaching out and grasping. That is actually an action. That that, that visual experience um, is is in, in, at at a certain level of the brain the same thing as a grasping, and that's a super key concept here. That all thinking, all cognition, uh, is a form of action. And even when you're sitting laying in bed trying trying to think about your decisions in life. Um, you're actually taking action in the world. It's in an abstract. It's in it's in an abstract space, but it's this. It's the same, you know, fundamental parts of the brain that you that you use to reach out and, and grasp things. So all thinking is embodied. Emb uh, this is sort of a radical embodied uh, viewpoint. This is this is this is not something every single uh, neuroscientist or psychologist. Um, you know, full, does a full-throated endorsement of, but this sure looks like where the, where the future consensus is heading, and I, I certainly encourage you to to read more into this if this is interesting to you. Um, so you can think of all thinking uh, as 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 a metaphors of of acting, and so um, one of the 
One of the other key concepts here is this action perception thing. And so um, the, the, there's a tendency to think that, um, or to, to, to think about perception and action as first you uh, uh, um, perceive, get the stimuli uh, and then that creates the action. But it, it looks like you really can't separate those things. It looks like the, 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 you can't actually perceive something without taking some action. And remember just looking out at the mountains, there's a part of your brain where that's the same thing as reaching out and grasping. And w you have to choose what to attend to. You have to choose where to look. Um, and in order to look at something and see it, there's an apple at the desk. Um, it just, just, you have an infinite number of things, you, of, of, of input streams coming in, and you have to disambiguate it all. And, you, and those are actions that you're choosing to say, well, okay, I'm, I care about this area because that's like a desk thing and that's part of something I want to do. And then there's an apple that's part of food, and now I can see that apple. Well, just that process of taking in the scene, desk, apple, um, is actually an action, even if you just stood there. It doesn't feel like it. I mean, we're, 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 we're sort of taught uh, our, our normal conceptualizations is that sort of some passive, re passive reaction. Um, but, but it's not. Um, th that is the same as, as, as grasping. And that is what embodied cognition means. Um, now, there, it, it's not to say that grasping is the, is the same fundamental thing as seeing at all levels, but it, there's, there's, there's a level within the brain, so to speak, uh, where those things are the same. Uh, and, and navigation in space, a acting with our bodies in space, appears to be what brains are for. And so when you're just trying to think about what you want to do with your life, you're navigating in space. You know, you're navigating in abstract space, but you're, but you're, you're moving your body in space. Um, even though you, you have sort of proxies for your body and you have proxies for space. But when you're thinking about, say, your college trajectory in your career, you can't quite help but have it be navigatory. And that's why our, our, our communication are, is narrative. That's why the stories we tell are narrative. That's why we love linear uh, narratives. It's, it's part of also why we love um, you know, causal arrows that only go one way. Because it's, it's how we think. And, and, and that's it, it's part of uh, the constraints on how we on how we think, but we see everything this way because that that's actually how we evolved. So, and then approach and avoidance. The, we do we appear to have two fundamental modes, um, and this would make sense. You know, that that you're either heading towards something, which means you're in a goal oriented mode, which means you think you understand where you're at. Uh, things are making sense. You, uh, you're 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 chasing after some sort of um, homeostatic driven process, you know, I'm, I've got to get some food, I've got to get some water, I've got to get whatever. Uh, and the world then be, can become um, what, you know, what you see, what you attend to is then centered around those goals. So you can, you see things as tools, you can see things as obstacles, and then you tend to not see anything else. And then we also have a, an avoidance mode. And these things run in parallel because you have to be on the alert all the time. Um, especially like a gazelle needs to be on the alert all the time. Um, uh, you know, a, a cheetah maybe just a little bit less, and maybe a big male lion even a little bit less. But I mean, every, there's threats for everything. You know, there's always poisonous snakes, and there's always competing lions. So we have these uh, th this avoidance mode uh, that, that uh, seems to be pretty fundamental too. And avoidance seems to be around threats and seems to be around reducing uncertainty. Okay, another really cool thing here, uh, and and this this. Uh, um, is a nice segue from talking about approach uh, avoidance, you know, in two fundamental modes. So another way you can think of it is, is we sort of have two fundamental minds. You know, we have two hemispheres, and those hemispheres um, have different, uh, different purposes. Um, it, it looks, generally speaking, and, 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 and there are some people that have this, the, these, the, appear to have these, these hemispheres reversed, and it isn't just because you're, like, left-handed doesn't necessarily... Uh, mean it's all, uh, all your hemispheres are com are, are are also switched. Um, it's just more complicated than that. There's there's more there's more things than just a simple um, um, left hand right hand. But whatever, just the major the vast majority of of, uh, of uh, people are covered by this. Uh, the point is that there's asymmetry here, right or left, and the right hemisphere's f uh, primary purpose uh, seems to be. 
Um, and this is a gross oversimplification, but it appears to be extending to the external world, uh, attending to the external world, uh, taking everything in um, and not breaking it down. And it seems like the left hemisphere's um, job, it's, to some extent, is to attend to the right hemisphere, sort of. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, the, it, it looks like the right hemisphere's job is to experience um, sort of everything all at once and the, the, like the full pattern. In the left hemisphere, um, I mean, it, we, we've got eyes and, and, uh, and sensory nerves and, 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 and uh, ears on the left, and that's definitely coming in. So the left is definitely getting stimuli as well. But at the, the, um, um, the, the, the cortical structures, the, the, the um, um, most recently evolved neocortex of the left hemisphere appears to be attending a lot to the full pattern of the right hemisphere, and it appears to be breaking it down into pieces. And it, it appears to be deconstructing it um, for the purposes of acting in the world. Uh, in order to do that, it has, to, it has to simplify that world. It has to dimensionally reduce it. And that's really uh, a, a fundamental uh, to this concept of implicit and explicit. And an imp imp implicit thing is something you know, uh, um, but you, you, you don't necessarily know how to explain it. Uh, you don't necessarily know how to carve it at its joints, so to speak, and break it down. Uh, and that's what it means when something is explicit. Uh, and it, it is explainable. Um, it, an implicit thing doesn't mean you don't know it. Uh, it. It doesn't mean you don't experience it. It isn't the same as, as, as it being unconscious. Um, it means, but it, it, it means that your conscious awareness is of the whole. But before you can take the whole, like, I know how to, you know, I, I, I'm... This is a bad example because uh, I don't shoot baskets uh, very well anymore. Um, but I know how to shoot a free throw. Um, that's different than being able to break it down and explain all the all the steps. And and maybe I've just learned it and I know the pattern. Um, but if I actually break it down and and talk about my hands and my arms and and and, and all the little pieces that I'm doing. I'm now breaking it down into into pieces, so I'm explicating it. So that, that that's that's a simple example, but it looks like the right hemisphere's um, purpose in life uh, is, impl is is predominantly implicit, uh, and that the, the 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 right hemisphere's job and the left hemisphere's job uh, is to sort of explain it so that it can act. And and it's then no surprise that the the left hem le left hemisphere for the vast majority of people is where language is, because language itself is a dimensional reduction to the complexity of the world, uh, in order for us to uh, exchange it. But so much information is lost when when uh, you break things down into language, but it's still super powerful. Anyway, so th this is a very important concept. You you might run into some real some real old stuff about the right brain, left brain, and like the right brain's creative and the left brain is analytical, and that's not really on point. It's not really. Um, I mean, there's 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 a way of looking at that where that is sort of accurate, um, but it's a real real gross gross smearing. Um, um, uh, puts a lot of Vaseline on the lens, so to speak, in terms of being able to really understand it. it it's really better to look at it as. Um, a holistic versus a, 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 a breaking down in a, uh, into parts. And another thing that's really critical from a concept here is that rationality is, is bounded. What does that mean? Um, well, we can only think of so many things at once. You know, working memory is limited. It, um, people have said, uh, you know, seven plus or minus two, and, but now it, it appears to be um, more like three or four type fundamental things that we can we can we can hold in our brain if we build associations and, and chunk things in a certain way um, um, like um, grouping letters together and, and shrinking them into, into into smaller things in our brain uh, we can make it seem like uh, we, we can hold lots of stuff in our memory but it's actually a multiple step process anyway they're, they're fundamental limits right um, I mean try to envision what five dimensions looks like we, uh, I mean, there'll be physicists that will argue that, that, that you know, reality, uh, and that's, a, that's another topic of what, what do we mean by that, but that reality, uh, as uh, observed by physics, could have many, many dimensions. Well, we can only envision like three spatial dimensions, and then we can envision movement, and that's sort of like, sort of like a fourth dimension. And then we have these interesting subjective things like colors, um, you know, the, uh, that are, are 
that we can't really break down um, other than, you know, that's a weird shade. We can label it. That's a weird shade of whatever orange. Um, and there's dimensionality to those colors. But, I mean, what is a fifth uh, or a sixth a spatial dimension? Which, I mean, try to think of it. You can't. Um, so, so we're limited. Uh, we're limited to um, spatial navigation level um, constructions. So all of our uh, um, cognition, uh, our most brilliant human, is still constrained, is still bounded by things like um, you know, three dimensions moving in space. And, every, and anything that, 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 that the most brilliant mind can do to abstract is still going to be restrained to that, and so certain types of nonlinearities, um, uh, certain certain types of uh, it's why statistics often uh, are counterintuitive uh, in some cases. Um, it really kind of depends on on uh, whether that we have an evolved structure for that kind of thing. So it, it appears that that we have um, you know. Uh, you know, multiple evolved structures in our brain. Each one of them are, uh, are 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 limited in their capability, and so bounded ration, rationality is a is a really important concept. We are not one big um, computer program. Um, I mean, there's a there's a information processing uh, um, model that uh, has lived a long time. It's it's going away now. Um, but this is sort of a uh, a input process it output. Uh, it's a useful model, um, but uh, it, it, it doesn't really do justice to how uh, our brains work uh, um, it, 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 at, a, at, a, at a more detailed level. Okay, so one way to think of it is we're kind of more like run multiple apps running at once. And some of those apps can get our attention and some uh, our conscious attention, and some of them are running in the background. So to try to keep this, and this is, you know, anytime you deal with metaphors like this, it's where and you lose something, um, but it's better to think of 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 uh, oh, people have called them cognitive gadgets, and people have called it you know networks and that sort of thing. But we do appear to have multiple um, things that run in parallel, and that they they're all kind of vying for attention depending upon what their state is, and then uh, um, higher level systems uh, can be activated. And then the, the highest level, um, so to speak, of consciousness um, kind of floats around uh, to take action in the world uh, for whatever the most important thing calling for attention is. So anyway, these are, these are sophisticated concepts. Um, they're not going to be on the test. I, I would like uh, uh, to hear from you uh, about what, what was you know, really interesting, what was not, what made no sense to you um, for, uh, for extra credit. Okay, so uh, multiple apps running at the same time. Uh, our rationality is limited. Our ability to think is limited within each app. Um, and then that, this is interesting. So causal arrows. This happened because that happened. We actually create that. Um, we, we, those inferences, those uh, um, I heard a noise uh, uh, and then, there, then I saw a snake. Um, that snake caused that noise. Um, you have to... Um, create that and it does I mean it, it, you have a lot of automatic processes to do that it's not like you, you have to be aware you're creating it but that's how associations work is we sort of label we tag it and sometimes we're just, we're just wrong um, um, and it I mean better to be wrong um, and uh, just waste a little bit of time or miss out an opportunity versus being wrong uh, and um, getting bit by a snake and dying so I mean it, evolution has has biased us uh, to make these inferences, and to, uh, but it, 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 it makes us very biased to ascribe causality. And we tend to ascribe that causality in w one direction. It's very difficult for us to um, think about reciprocality. It's, it's very difficult to think how things are, are, can be entangled together and that, it, and that you, one isn't necessarily causing the other. And, and that's why like causation versus correlation ends up being a challenging thing for people as well. So causality is an action that we take sort of, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a Sharpie we put, um, uh, on, uh, on experiences and we draw the, we draw the arrow. No, it's so fundamental that, uh, it's hard to believe it's not, you know, real, but, um, the, the reality, uh, to the extent that we're able to access it, uh, it um, is way more complicated than that. 
So our, our, our brains uh, do have uh, some pretty severe limits and it, it, it affects how we perceive the world. Okay, uh, what else we got here? Um, so a lot of times when we're attributing cause, you know, the, that's so that we have our story to tell. Um, that's so that we have our linear narrative, um, which fits the way we think about the world, which gives us something useful um, uh, and, and can reduce uncertainty as we, as we navigate uh, the future. Okay, so that, what does that, all that mean? Well, that means fundamentally that reality is rendered. That means that what you perceive as reality is a creation of your, of your mind. I mean, it, it, there's a really good argument to make that your mind is doing the best it possibly can to represent some actual external thing called reality, and I'm not going to get into those philosophical arguments, but I mean, have you ever driven down the road uh, in, uh, in twilight in an area, a rural area where there's deer, and have you ever seen a, a rural mailbox that you, you actually thought was a deer for just a, a brief moment? And then you realize it's not a deer. Well, for a moment, it was actually kind of a mailbox that you're, you actually, I'm sorry, it was, um, uh, uh, the, if you're, if you're driving and there's a mailbox, but you think it's a deer. Okay. Uh, back, backwards here, what I said, um, you, you're, you're driving along and you see a deer on the side of the road. Uh, and then you, uh, about to hit the brakes and then you realize it's a mailbox. Well, you, you, you really kind of did see a deer there for a, a split second. That doesn't mean that the, re, that, the, that the deer existed. But to your reality, you saw a deer. Uh, and, and you have mechanisms in your brain that render reality. Uh, and it's trying to get it right, but sometimes it gets, gets, it gets it wrong. And so you see something that, that uh, um, doesn't stay. It gets replaced by something else, um, like, a, like, a, like a glitch in the matrix, so to speak. Okay, so we only see what we know uh, uh, and predict. So you have to actually understand, you have to actually have to have identified what something is. You actually have to have a memory for it in order to actually see it. But that, that's a pretty um, complex uh, topic in and of itself. Okay, another important thing here about life is life is always see seeking niches. Um, so this is an evolutionary argument, uh, but, but it, uh, it's pretty compelling. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can be successful. We gotta find a place to eat. We need to find a place to, to where we can uh, uh, survive and thrive and uh, hopefully reproduce. You know, and whether you're uh, a, a, a cell um, you know, with uh, um, mitochondria living inside of uh, inside of you for energy, you, you you still need to find an environment where um, everything works for you. So uh, all animals have evolved to. Uh, move in the world, some much quicker than others, so that they can eat and escape other animals. Uh, as things got more social, we learned to collaborate and compete. We formed in-groups and out-groups and networks and hierarchies to establish and find more niches. Um, and then unlike other animals, you know, we actually change our environment. We create niches. And, and in fact, that we also are able to switch niches. And it's really, there's a lot of complexity to all of this. Uh, a little bit of... Uh, a teaser into what, what do we mean? Um, nature and nurture, uh, they're the same thing. Um, they're part of a, I don't know what they are, what it is um, exactly. You know, it's, 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 it's part of our bounded ra rationality, um, but fundamentally nature and nurture aren't two things, um, but we can't understand it without, um, you know, breaking it into pieces. But for sure, our, our, our nature and nurture are not separate processes. Um, you, can, you can't, uh, can't really separate them because there's plenty of nurture happening at the cell level. That's what uh, epigenetic expression is. Um, so the gene expression matters more than the genes. The fact that you have a gene that might um, code for, for a biomolecule doesn't mean it did. And if it did encode, it doesn't matter unless the rest of the environment, which is the nurture, was ready to react to it. So epigenetics matters more than genetics. Um, a lot of nurtures happen, happening at the early cellular level and in the womb. I mean, you, they do twin studies and then, and then uh, uh, attach, before you take a twin study and say that, um, um, therefore, it's 50% genetic, um, you have to remember that even if the twins were separated at birth and, and raised in different areas, they experienced a lot of commonality and, and it's in to argue that so did fraternal twins. Well, they, eh, um, they didn't start out as a single cell. And even at the cellular level, there's, there's plenty of nurturing going on. So it's, it's actually really, really complicated. Um, 
and that's why it's difficult for uh, uh you know to try to actually figure out you know what is other than like where they actually do discover there's one gene for something um for some of the more complex things like um intelligence and personality where you know people can argue that it's 50 percent heritable heritable um well heritable doesn't necessarily mean genetic it, it, it could mean um that just very early on the the, the early epigenetic conditions uh, were similar enough okay um some of the other complexity uh, that relates to brains um you know mental illness is a, is a moving target and what we really do is we stigmatize what doesn't conform which means that culture is actually um a huge part of what we consider mental illness now I'm, that's not necessarily the same as is is uh you know, if you have a, a huge lesion, if you have a major stroke or major brain damage, um, that that isn't something that would likely result in um, uh, in an, a thing we would consider an illness or a disorder across pretty much every culture. Uh, um, but if you actually look at uh, 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 various things uh, um, that uh, we've labeled as mental illness in the past, um, sometimes they're not... Uh, they're not labeled that when the culture adjusts. So um, just part of the complexity here. Another huge part of the complexity we're just beginning to understand is the microbiome. You know, we're hosting, um, I think you have more cells, uh, you know, bacteria and yeast and that sort of thing, more cells in your gut than you have um, cells that belong to your body. Now it happens that a eukaryote cell, your, your cell or human body cells are typically much, much, much larger in size than a, like a, a bacteria t uh, cell typically. Um, so we still beat them obviously by volume, uh, but they've got us by number. And it, and it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can't live without some of them, and, but it also looks like some of them can manipulate us in different ways. And we're finding ties of microbiome to immune system responses and, and even some uh, um, interactions with, uh, with, with mental health. So this is an area uh, of really exciting exploration right now, and it turns out that this, these um, sometimes symbiotic, sometimes parasitic, um, the, but these uh, these creatures we we live with and, and can't not live with, um, you know, they they're evolving and finding niches, and and so in some cases it's in their best interest to manipulate this this giant uh, vessel that they're riding. So lots of interesting interactions happen at the microbiome level that we're just beginning to understand. Um, another thing on this complexity is we can't find a mechanism for consciousness. We don't know where it is. Um, and for all of the effort of uh, a materialistic approach, a reductionistic approach, um, the, uh, you know, what science is able to explore, what physics is able to explore, um, um, we can't find it. Um, we can't find anything on uh, for subjective experience. We can't uh, we, we can't even um, you know say what its pieces are. Now that that doesn't mean that somehow we won't be able to, uh, but uh, um, it, it, I don't know where we're going to begin here. So it does this appears to be a, a you know a kind of a limit to our bounded rationality that that it even affects um, how we look at physics and what we call physics and what we call biology. So um, there's there is a a massive amount of mystery still left here and consciousness may be the the most fundamental uh, mystery okay uh, some other stuff about us humans um, in groups and out groups I mean we form in groups obviously we're social but we also form out groups and and we tend to be really altruistic and supportive um, often to our in-group members and, and we can be just absolutely awful uh, to our out-groups, not universally. And part of one of the, the um, stories of the success of, of, of humans is, is our ability to abstract out what do we mean by the in-group. It doesn't actually have to be just our baboon troop, so to speak, or just our chimp troop um, by cultural creations. Um, we're able to shift our identity to mo much more than just, you know, the sort of the familial groups that we grew up in. So we can actually f uh, um, um, have mental flexibility in how we define our in-group. And, and a lot of the arguments we have in society around um, things like marginalized people um, and a lot of the conflict that we have, uh, you know, stems around where we've driven, the, drew these lines around in-groups and out-groups. You know the 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 problem 
um, is uh, it's really fundamental that we that we have to have outgroups. It seems, um, and we don't have a, we don't have aliens that have attacked us yet, so that we can have some giant meta outgroup, so we can all be one uh, human race yet. So you know we're, we try to make cultural constructs that let, let, that lets us uh, think of all all of our fellow humans, and then people would argue. Certainly, uh, you know, the uh, vegans and other folks would argue that they, that this in-group conceptualization needs to include much more than just humans. And I'm not well, I'm having that I'm not having that argument one way or one way or another. Um, but you should understand, uh, you know, um, what's at play here. And and when when we put somebody as an outgroup, um, boy, um, you know, we can be um, worse than worse than chimps. Where chimps, male chimps will will rip the faces off and bite the hands off, rip the testicles off of, of, a, of, a, of a, um, neighboring troop if they find them, uh, in their territory. And, and we can do far worse than that. Um, and, and even, uh, as, as, uh, we, 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 we think of ourselves as, uh, you know, kind and generous and that sort of thing. Well, um, there, as we speak, there's a conflict going on in, 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 in the Ukraine and, and, um, YouTube has uh, relaxed um, Facebook as well as the social media has relaxed some of their um, requirements about uh, showing violence um, and uh, to some extent and um, there have been a number of videos of, of Russian tanks blowing up and everybody cheering and I'm not I'm not making a, a commentary whatsoever about the uh, uh, about the, uh, the about the war my point is, uh, um, you know, those are those are young conscripts burning alive, and uh, we can, uh, uh, as humans, um, celebrate that. Um, not not universally, uh, but we can go there really quick. Uh, we can we can firebomb um, cities in war um, and and celebrate it uh, as you know we well we had to do it. Um, so uh, I'm not getting into I don't I'm not having an argument. I'm not trying not to take the position that uh, um, all of the, all those behaviors are wrong or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out the behavior and I'm, I want uh, you to understand fundamentally that no matter how many books you read, um, no matter how you feel about, about uh, the people around you, uh, you are fully capable of becoming horrible. Uh, um, if you've got like an out group, you know, with especially with a threat or a disgust association with that. So all of us, you know, the the um, line between good and evil cuts through the heart of everybody. So um, anyway, so <laughs> this is uh, this is heavy stuff. Um, so when when humans have in groups, we create and enforce norms, and that, that is a huge part of uh, of culture. And we can be vicious when somebody violates our norms. I mean, it it is. Um, it's another area where humans can be quite awful, a norm enforcement. And, and there's lots of reasons for, uh, for why we would be that way. Um, but we uh, should definitely be aware of, of uh, our, uh, our tendencies uh, to, be, uh, <laughs> to be both wonderful and generous and warm and kind and loving and giving and complete sons of bitches. Um, okay, uh, human in-groups are often bound together by shared narratives, shared binding narratives. They're shared fictions, if you will. Uh, they're, they're shared stories, um, and uh, people don't like it when those shared stories get challenged, um, and they certainly don't even like it when you you say that the binding narratives themselves are fictions. Um, so you'll see this, uh, you know, with with uh, people respond historically and contemporaneously with how people respond uh, to when their say their ideology is challenged or where their where their religion is uh, is um, is challenged because it's a direct uh, challenge to the binding narrative. And it and it and it, it it's a threat. We we respond to it as a threat, and uh, we've done a lot, at least in the West and some other cultures, to try to develop um, um, ways of looking at at these things, so we don't immediately go to, to a, a threat response. But uh, boy, do we have a tendency to not like um, having our you know fundamental axioms uh, challenged and our binding narratives challenged. Now, sometimes in-group norms, I mean, can seem so arbitrary, but an uh, interesting phenomenon happens where uh, we often define our norms simply around whatever the opposite uh, norms of a nearby group is, and that's the source of many odd taboos. That's a, that's a, um, 
very interesting uh, um, thing that you might want to think hard about, which is we often um, define ourselves uh, not by who we are, but by who we're not. I mean, that's a uh, that's a thing. You, you if you start looking for it, you'll 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 see it a lot. Um, and and I, I think it fundamentally has to do with um, how our brains actually work uh, and how, how it has to do with uh, when you're writing, when you're telling the story of history, it's not necessarily about the events you choose and the arrows, it's, it's about the events you, you don't choose. Um, and that the inhibition of things, the, 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 um, the um, removal of all the other possibilities and, and to have what's left being the thing, um, that seems to be the the way we approach most stuff, and it's actually how actually how our, our neurons uh, neurons work. Without without getting into too much detail, but so, so um, when we uh, build our identities, um, you know, when we uh, build our cultural uh, um, binding narratives and that sort of thing, when we establish our our traditions and norms, uh, they're often um, they're often built around a ways to uh, that differentiate our in-group from an out-group. And sometimes if an out-group is doing something pretty conspicuous, um, well, we're the people that don't do that. You know, we're the people that don't, that don't eat pork. You know, we're the, we're the people that only eat these kinds of animals. Um, in some cases, those are, those are smart things that may have evolved because of parasites and that sort of thing. And then, and, 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 and that can very well be true. But a lot of times it's just built around, um, it's easier, it's quicker, uh, it's more in line with how our brains work. To define ourselves by what we're not, so it's interest. That's an interesting thing. You should uh, you should think about that and uh, and look for it. Okay, let's finish up here. Um, the workplace uh, as the environment. This is uh, if you're taking a, a biological lens and evolutionary lens um, to a uh, psychology applied to work. Um, again, re remember this place we call work is actually an environment. Uh, and so when you think about humans as animals uh, and animals needing niches. Uh, careers and jobs are niches, uh, and there's a survive and thrive uh, element to it. You know, it's it's not quite the stakes aren't quite as immediate. Um, but I tell you, if you can't make a career work, um, it can it it might not result in immediate starvation, but um, uh, it can it can definitely have an effect on you know whether you whether you find a mate, uh, whether you're able to get uh, housing and shelter, and I mean the time skills a little more drawn out because of the success of our of our society that we, we we've got a little bit more cushion and some safety nets, but really uh, it is a it is a competitive environment um, and we're trying to find a niche. Um, organizations themselves, you know, have networks and hierarchies just like any social group, just like a bunch of baboons. Ours may be more complicated, um, uh, more sophisticated, ha and have a powerpoints associated with it, but still networks and hierarchies. Now, good news is, is you actually have a lot of evolved mechanisms for navigating this. Um, organizations themselves, just like life, because organizations are a bunch of, uh, it's the aggregate uh, uh, effect of a bunch of people. They are in the prediction game. And one of the ways that you can be successful in your career, that you can, uh, you can create value for an organization, is based on your ability to help win the future. Um, now, organizations themselves are chock full of niches, uh, but niches come and go. Uh, the you know technology is a big part of that, uh, but also it's a competitive landscape often, and and, and markets uh, and market leaders uh, move around. Okay, um, let's uh, end this uh, with uh, just a perspective on evolution. So obviously, um, um, life evolves, uh, but really anything produced by life evolves. So anything alive. So bacteria evolves, obviously people, monkeys, um, but so does technology. I mean, if, if you, it, obviously technology evolves. I mean, technology evolves so fast, too fast. Um, culture evolves. Um, really anything that is a product of, uh, 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 of humans is, is potentially a, a thing that, that you can um, see evolutionary change to. So business models change, business processes change, products obviously evolve, um, and they compete in evolving markets. And those markets themselves um, have evolved partially just because the businesses have evolved. Uh, I'm just turning this around so that you understand that there's a reciprocal causality here. This isn't a one-way arrow. Um, that the business itself or your or the work um, that has a lot uh, in common with uh, with um, non-human uh, um, um, 
elements of, of nature. So you've got competition and cooperation. You've got exchange. You've got a kind of, you've got reproduction. People copy businesses. Um, people copy business models. You've got uh, things trying to survive. You have businesses that die. Uh, you've got different elements of, of, of thriving. You've got, you've got, you know, success hierarchies within, within business. And it's because it's full of living agents because there's people and they're acting and you get a bunch of agents, you get a living agents uh, in an organization and have them act. Um, that organization itself will, will manifest uh, things similar to uh, uh, the agents themselves. Um, okay. Uh, instability drives a lot of change. But the good news is, is, is anytime you have instability, you'll, you'll, I mean, eventually you'll have something more stable and that more stable thing tends to, tends to win. You can think of that as, um, you know, from a species competition standpoint, the, the stable things, the stable business processes, the, 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 the more stable, um, uh, products, um, the more stable people in an organization, uh, they are by definition not creating the instability. They are more aligned with with uh, whatever they're trying, whatever niche, appropriate niche, uh, um, should uh, should exist there. And so the stable tends to push out the unstable, which is a way of looking at like a kind of uh, survival of the fittest kind of thing, and or an, an adaptationist approach. Um, and, and the more things are stable, the more the future is more predictable. So it's the stability uh, is driving out uncertainty. Now, the, these things don't live in a vacuum. And you have a lot of other factors that come at things, like COVID hits and everything's all messed up from a business standpoint. So instability often gets gets uh, pushed upon you. So, so things are constantly uh, evolving. Okay, so that finishes our lecture. And we talked about um, prediction machines and embodiment and bounded ra rationality. We talked about niches. We talked about in-groups and out-groups. Uh, um, we talked about the workplace as an environment. And we talked about how everything evolves. Um, next lecture, lecture four, will be uh, about the science of IO psychology. We'll be going back to the, um, uh, to the book, to, to chapter two. We'll talk about the scientific method. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about psychology and its maturity, how mature of a science is, is it. We'll talk about variables and the replication crisis uh, and experiments and observation and surveys. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you for lecture four.